up guys, welcome to this review of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 1. Set after the events of Star Wars The Clone Wars, like immediately after the events of Star Wars The Clone Wars. The war has come to an end, this Bad Batch group of clones who are very unique with special abilities and enhancements is now a bit lost in the galaxy as the Empire is rising up and starting to take control. What's their new role in the galaxy? They come across this other clone who's also a modified clone just like them in a certain way and now they just need to find out what the hell's going on, what's next for them. That's what the series is all about. So what did I think about this? Well first before I go into any of that let me say that I am going to be talking some spoilers for The Bad Batch Season 1 so if you haven't seen The Bad Batch Season 1 go watch that then come back and watch the rest of this. Anyway, The Bad Batch Season 1 I think is good overall. Not great, not better than okay. I think there's a lot of room for improvement for future seasons as we now we know we are getting at least another season of this and I think the core story from beginning to end focusing on the Bad Batch is good. I think there's a good overarching narrative in there. The problem is that there are 16 episodes and that core story isn't featured in all of them. In fact a lot of the episodes this season are the Bad Batch going on little mini adventures that are just kind of escapades and little fun side stories that don't really need to be there. They are fun, they are entertaining, but they don't add a lot to the overarching narrative at all. And basically whenever the villains, the Empire, with Crosshair, a former member of the Bad Batch, whenever they're in the episode, that tends to be a good episode or even sometimes a better than good episode. But when they're not in there, when they're not the focus of the narrative, when they're not the main enemies, that's when this show does falter a little bit. But throughout the series, there's a lot of good action, there's some emotion in there, there's some heart in there, there's some strong themes and messages throughout there as well. It's all very classic Star Wars. If you like the Clone Wars, this very much is a continuation of the Clone Wars TV show, just with a, a new focus. Rather than being just the clones and the Jedi, it's very specifically about the Bad Batch, with a couple of little exceptions. And because there are 16 episodes, because there are episodes where they go on these side adventures, there's sometimes a string of them in a row. There's a bunch of them around like between like 10 to 14, I'm gonna say. That's just a random number I'm throwing out there, it might not be exact. But there's a bunch of episodes where they are just going on these side adventures and where the main narrative kind of gets lost a little bit. In that one minute we're under the impression that Crosshair and the Empire is hunting down the Bad Batch. Then they go on this bunch of adventures and then we finally see Crosshair again and he's like, oh, shall I hunt them down now? He's like, right, were you already doing that? I don't know. It does lose its focus, it does lose its narrative and it does feel like they are trying to drag things out of it. And there are some cool little Star Wars easter eggs and cameos in this season. So characters from the Clone Wars, from Rebels and from the Mandalorian show up in this show. And yeah, it's cool, it's entertaining, it's fun, but it doesn't need to be there a lot of the times. Cad Bane shows up and that is probably one of the best things about this season. Him showing up and finally getting more Cad Bane is brilliant. That's how you do a Star Wars cameo in the modern era, I would say. But then you've got Fennec Shan showing up from The Mandalorian. Yeah, we get to see her origins. That's cool as well. It makes sense, it adds to her origins, it adds to her character. But then you've got ones like Hera and Kanan, and it's like, right, we know these characters had origin stories, but did they have to be so closely tied together? Did the Bad Batch have to be tied to every other period of this Star Wars universe? They're now tied to the prequel era with the Clone Wars, they're now tied to the Empire era with Rebels, they're now tied to the Mandalorian. Is that right? At a certain point it becomes a little cheesy and it becomes, it makes the galaxy feel really small and I think they can just go a little too far. It's fine to do two episodes focusing on er Hera's origin story, but that could have been its own thing separate from the Bad Batch. That could have been like just a standalone one-off TV special on Disney Plus or something without the Bad Batch featured in it. But the fact that the Bad Batch is so involved with Hera's origin story it just feels like, it feels forced. It's very coincidental, very cheesy. And it's also worth saying that certain characters like Kanan, who shows up in the first episode, Caleb Dune, or whatever you want to call him, 
His origin story has now been told twice, in a comic book and now in this. And in this, it's very different from the comic book. They changed the location, they changed the circumstances of it. Not hugely different, but it does mean that, hey, what is canon now? Is that comic book still canon? Is this canon? Well, yes, we know this is definitely canon. But it means like, right, what about this book that I'm currently reading? Is this book actually canon or is there going to be a TV show in the future that retcons it? It's a little worrying when they're releasing everything and saying it's all canon, only to then retcon it later on. But let's get into how the plot progresses. It deals with Crosshair and his allegiance to the Empire. The Bad Batch feel like the Empire is bad. They don't trust the Empire. More like, that's more specific about what they feel. Crosshair, however, he's all for the Empire. And we're led to believe for a long time that it's because of his inhibitor chip. But then we find out pretty late in the season that, oh no, he's had that chip removed. So he actually just likes the Empire. He likes being part of this Empire. He likes being a tool to be used. Although maybe he doesn't realise that that's quite what he is. And there's a good line where, to them, you will always just be a number. Something along those lines. I probably butchered it. But anyway, it really strings home and I think it gets him thinking. I don't think Crosshair's ever going to be a good guy. But I do think, I don't think he's ever going to go back to the Bad Batch. I don't think he should. I think it's too far gone now. But it does open up some possibilities for future storylines for him. And it's really intriguing. It really does a good job at making him a, a three-dimensional character. Which is an issue for the Bad Batch themselves, which I will get into in just a bit. But the two-part finale, I think, is pretty good overall. It does a good job of inciting emotion. Now, in the two-part finale, Camino, we finally see what happens to Camino, and we get an idea of what happens to the clone troopers. Camino is destroyed, it sinks into the sea, and it's very emotional. They do a good job in this show of making Camino feel like this iconic, symbolic location, and obviously they use the John Williams themes and scores there, so that obviously amps up the emotion behind it, maybe even cheating a little bit. But it's a good emotional season finale, at least the first part of it. The second part is much more like a Poseidon adventure kind of thing, where they have to escape, and it's a bit more basic and less going on. I think they could have condensed that down, maybe made it just an extra long episode, rather than stretching it out. But I still liked it. But speaking of Camino and the Cold Troopers, this is my biggest disappointment with this season. And the time period in which this is set in, where the Republic's coming to an end and the Empire's rising up. That's a cool, very interesting time period. The problem is, we don't see any of it. The whole point of the show, I thought, was that we were finally going to see what happened to Camino, what happened to the Clone Troopers, how did the Empire rise up and take over. And we don't see that. Because this series is so focused on showing us what the Bad Batch sees and what the Bad Batch experiences, all we ever get is their reaction to it. And we don't ever get really like any explanations or any details. So one minute they're off doing their adventures, they then go back to Camino and hey, the clone troopers are gone. It's like, oh, I guess the clone troopers are gone. What happened to them? I don't know. I'm sure we'll find out in the future, but it would be nice to actually see that. And then there's another episode, for example, where they go to this planet and it's like, oh, the empires took over. They've introduced all these little elements of identification and passports and stuff like that. It's like, oh, it would have been cool to see how that got established. Instead, because we're seeing their reactions, it seems like everything's happening super quick. And it seems like a lot of the really interesting, juicy details are happening off screen. And as someone who likes the lore and the background and the depth of the Star Wars galaxy, it is disappointing that we're kind of brushing by all of this stuff. But anyway, let's talk about the characters, starting with the Bad Batch themselves. This is a little disappointing. I like the Bad Batch, but I couldn't tell you much about them. Because there's very little character growth for the core cast of characters here, with the exception of Omega, which I'll get into later. The Bad Batch themselves though, they don't all feel important, they don't all feel relevant, they don't all feel like three-dimensional beings. And I think that's somewhat deliberate because they have been soldiers all their life, they're trying to figure out what they are. But the problem is, by the end of the season, they haven't made any progress in that regard. They're still this unit, they're still considering themselves as soldiers. 
and they're not doing much to push beyond what they were. So for example, Hunter, he's just a yes or no guy. That's his role in this squad, that's his role in this series. There isn't, he's trying to take on a bit more of a fatherly figure role to Omega, but they never really address that beyond the obvious where he is taking care of her. Rekka, he is a lovable oaf of a character in many ways, and he's all about strength, he's all about aggression and violence and action, he wants to blow things up. And that's kind of him throughout this series, they do a good job of actually going a bit further and showing that he does have a softer side, but it's like, right, your role here is simply to cause some sort of disruption that the Bad Batch then has to fix. Then Echo and Tech. The reason I'm bringing these up together is that these two characters rarely have anything to do. Echo's the guy that explains everything. He has the answers for everything. He's the one that gives us explanation of what's going on. That's it. That's all he does this entire season. Echo, meanwhile, he's kind of just there. What's his role in this squad? What's his role in this series? I couldn't tell you. And one of the feelings, I think, of this series as a whole is that they have got these side adventures that they go on where there was a huge opportunity then for have maybe each episode to do like a focus on one of these characters where, hey, he has an episode where Hunter becomes the main character where his skills are used and we really get to see why he's a relevant, important character. And he has another one where Echo gets that chance and opportunity, but they don't do that. Instead of just, right, he has the squad, they go on this mission, do some action, save the day, hurrah! And it's all fun and entertaining, but it just lacks a little depth. So, Omega, the new character. I like this character a lot. I think there's a lot of interesting questions to be had about her. The problem is, the show isn't interested at all in answering those questions. There's a lot of teasing here, but no answers whatsoever. Is she a clone of Django Fett? We are led to presume that yes, she is. Why is she female? Why has she got the same aging process as Boba Fett? We don't know. Does she have any enhancements or abilities like the Bad Batch do? We don't know. We're led to believe that maybe not because they never address that. The Bad Batch never asks her any questions about who she is, where she came from, or anything about her. And that's really disappointing. It makes it seem like these characters do not care. And Omega does have growth throughout the series. She learns things, she learns skills and abilities, and she learns about the galaxy. We see a lot of the exploration and adventure sites from her because she is the duck out of water character going in and seeing these and experiencing these things for the first time. It's cool and it's interesting. And I think she's very likeable. But so many of the plot points about her character do mean that it's like, oh, Omega is ordered to do one thing. But guess what? She doesn't do that. Instead, she causes trouble, the Bad Batch have to react to that. And that's pretty much what happens in every episode. So again, disappointing. Fun, but lacking in sophistication and depth. So let's talk about the villains. I've already talked about Crosshair. I like him as a character. I think they do a good job at developing his motivations and personality and role in this show. There's another villain though called Rampart, who I'm less keen on. Rampart comes across as this very stereotypical, very typical empire, aristocratic, British voice bad guy. He's not all that compelling. I couldn't tell you anything about him. And he's just a normal empire guy. And another thing is that he's got a voice very similar to Agent Callus from Star Wars Rebels, in my opinion. So it's like, right, you're clearly not David or Yellow, and but you've clearly got a very similar voice and accent. It's distracting. The voice acting, by the way, is good. It's just it's very similar to something we've already seen. So to talk about the production, the animation's gorgeous. The lighting is brilliant. I think this is one of the best looking Star Wars TV shows ever made. It very much continues the animation style of Star Wars Clone Wars Season 7, although I think it tweaks it a little bit and in a good way. The sound design is brilliant, it's very atmospheric. Listen to this in a sound, round sound environment, it really makes you feel like you're in there. Going to Camino and having the storm happen all around you, it's really well done. All the sounds sound real and believable. 
You've obviously got sound cues and music cues from the movies as well. More so than what you would normally get in the Star Wars TV show. A lot of times they just do it every now and then, but this series it does seem to rely very heavily on the John Williams themes and scores, which is interesting. I don't know who's scoring this, I don't know if it's someone who's worked on Star Wars before. It's good, but I would like to see a little bit more originality going forward. So, let's talk about some miscellaneous points, some really interesting little bits and bobs here and there just before I end this review. There's an episode where we find out the origin story of Jabba the Hutt's Rancor. Right, that was fun. Did we need that? No. Did I expect that? No. Why did we say Jabba the Hutt's Rancor's origins? I don't know, but it turns out that it's actually not Jabba the Hutt's Rancor. I think they said that actually, no, this is just another Rancor. So it's like, right, you clearly built this up as if it was Jabba the Hutt's Rancor. Why, why isn't it Jabba the Hutt's Rancor? But anyway, it, it was a fun little side adventure that didn't really amount to much. So there's a new character called Sid, who's a bit of a, like a mercenary mission giver, I suppose you could call her. Voiced by Rhea Perlman from Cheers. That's a great little cameo. No less a cameo because she's in a bunch of episodes. In fact, the Bad Batch spend a lot of time with Sid, working for Sid, and it's interesting. Are they going to end up being mercenaries or bounty hunters? Is that what their fate is going to be? I don't know. But they spend a lot of time with Sid, and it does make me wonder why. Yeah, they need the credits, they need supplies, but it's not always clear that that's what they're doing. So there's a string of episodes where that's all they're doing, where they are just working for Sid, and they've kind of forgotten about Kamino and the clone troopers and the war and Crosshair, and it all feels like a big distraction. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't amount to much. I think if you take out all the episodes with Sid, maybe keep one in, in that it, where they go there just to get the money to establish, hey, this is how they're getting money. But if you take out the rest of them, I think this season as a whole will be much tighter, much better. The story, the core narrative about the Empire, about Crosshair, will work a lot better, in my opinion. So, there are connections to The Mandalorian, there are connections to Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, and specifically Palpatine, the cloning, and what happens to the clones and Kamino. All of this stuff looks like it's going to be connected, but I'm starting to worry that maybe this isn't going to be answered in this show. I don't know if we're going to get the answers of where did the Kaminoans go after this season. I think that might not be answered until season 3 of The Mandalorian or something else. And it's worrying because now all these shows are interconnected in such a strong way that it makes the galaxy feel small yet again. But it also means that we've got to watch them all to get the answers and it means like it's like having a little puzzle. It's like right, here's one piece of the puzzle, here's the other piece. They don't make much sense on their own but once you watch them both, that's when it comes together. It's like right, that's a cool idea but can't a show just be its own thing? I don't know. But anyway, The Bad Batch Season 1, it sounds like I'm much more negative on it than I am. I do like this show, I think it's a good show, I had a ball of a time watching it each and every week. I do wish it was slightly shorter, I do wish that they did a little bit more with the characters, particularly The Bad Batch themselves. But yeah, this is a good show and I think there's a lot of potential for it to become a great show in Season 2 and onwards. If you've liked this review of The Bad Batch, why not subscribe to my channel and of course follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Graham Bird. Until next time though, thanks for watching.